So I just want to welcome everyone this morning. This is a true silver lining to our retreat that we had to cancel in March at Bishop's Ranch. It's wonderful that we've been able to offer this, and I want to thank Father Sean in particular for wanting to continue with these lectures even in the new format rather than just waiting a year for another retreat. It's a real gift to all of us, and we're able to welcome people from all over the world for this. So thank you, Father Sean. Welcome everyone from wherever you are and whatever time it is where you are, and um, Father Sean. Thanks a million, Karen. Mm -hmm. Thanks a million, Pat. And uh, the, the, all of the heavy lifting has been done by Karen. I just turned you up to talk. And um, so you also, she sent out to you outlines, a general outline of the uh, three days, and then specific outlines for each of the topics. So we're obviously on lecture one right now, which is Celtic spirituality before Christianity arrived. And as you see, I've divided it into two sections. Section one is, uh, I want to talk about what um, uh, Celtic wisdom looked like before the arrival of Christianity. And there are five uh, sub points there. And then the section two, which is a short one, uh, what happened when they actually met with each other and interfaced for the first time. And then God willing, in the uh, afternoon lecture, I want to talk about, you know, how did they kind of cross fertilize what happened when they you know, became partners in spirituality. So let me get started then on the, uh, on the first lecture, um, section one, before Christianity and Celtic wisdom met. So um, around the same time uh, in world history, when there seemed to be an extraordinary outpouring you know, of wisdom all over the world. So in, for instance, in China, you had Lao Tzu and Kung Fu Tzu, uh, we're talking about mid uh, 550 BCE. We had uh, uh, Mahavira in India around the same time, and Gautama Siddhartha, the Buddha, around the same time. In Persia, you had the great prophet Zoroaster. Uh, in Israel, you had some of the great prophets like um, Jeremiah, who flourished about 600 uh, BCE, and Ezekiel about 550 BCE. And around this particular time, there was a band of people who were officially known as the Milesians, who having come across from Central Europe, right across to Europe to Spain, um, migrated from Spain out into the Atlantic and discovered Ireland. So we're talking about maybe 550, 600 BCE. So it was a period of world history when there was an extraordinary outpouring you know, of spirituality and wisdom traditions. And they arrived in Ireland and as you know, there's, there's no place where you're going to arrive at where you're going to be the first person there. So there was already a group of people there called the Tuatha Dé who had replaced an earlier people called the Firbolgs, who had replaced an earlier people called, you know, the kind of the, uh, the Fomorians. And so it was just one wave of peoples after the other. In fact, I make the claim that there is no, there's no group of people living anywhere on planet Earth on land that hasn't been taken from previous owners. And this kind of happens again and again and again and again. So we're all, in some senses, occupying land, you know, that previous groups of people occupied. And so that's, that was the case for the, uh, the Malaysians, who are better known as the Celts. So they arrive in Ireland around sometime 600 BCE, and they find the land occupied by the Tuatha Dé Danann. And the Tuatha Dé Danann, you know, it translates as the people of the goddess Dana. And so there were two great battles between the Celts and the uh, Tuatha Dé Danann, and the Celts won both of the battles. And so finally they came to an agreement. The agreement was that they would divide the land of Ireland equally between the two groups. But it wasn't the kind of arrangement you'd imagine that one group gets the north and the other gets the south, or one group gets the east and the other gets the west. The agreement was that the Celts would get Ireland above the ground, and the Tuatha Dé Danann would get Ireland below the ground. And so the Tuatha Dé Danann shape-shifted and became what's subsequently known in Ireland as the We People. In Gaelic, we call them the Slua She, the fairy host. But they're known by many, many names in Ireland. And in spite of the fact that they were defeated in those battles and went underground, they have been a vital part of Irish folklore and Irish mythology and Irish spirituality. Even when I was a child growing up in the 1940s, the fairy folk or the wee people, you know, were still a very important part of our uh, wisdom tradition. So that's just by way of introduction. So when the Celts then established themselves, and it's interesting that 
we know a lot about the Celts, not just from their own stories, but actually from um, Caesar. Caesar, when he con conquered uh, England, yeah, Great Britain, I think around maybe 55 BC, uh, and France, that area, he wrote about the, the uh, Celts whom he'd encountered, you know, in uh, the north of France and in the south of England, yeah, and Cornwall particularly. And so he talks about the three great wisdom traditions uh, he found among the Celts. So I'm going to just deal a little bit with each of these traditions for a few moments. So the first group of wisdom holders would be the, uh, whom we know, we call them the bards. And the bards are the keepers of the past. That was their, you know, portfolio, the keepers of the past. And so uh, there were historians and there were genealogists. And it was an oral tradition. There were no written records that they could kind of uh, uh, refer to and kind of uh, brush up on. So they had to uh, memorize these extraordinary lists genealogically and historically. That was part of their task. There were also poets, minstrels, storytellers, and performing artists. And as far as the music was concerned, they had to be able to produce three kinds of music. And in Gaelic, we call them suantri, Goldtri, August Gyantri. So Suantri is music that can soothe the savage breast. And also lullabies that can, you know, let a child go to sleep, soothe the child. So that was the first kind of music that they had to be able to produce. And the second was Goldtri, which means nostalgic music. That's what you're able to make you, you know, weep for the past or, you know, for uh, long people who are gone, you know, um, to soothe again. With the, with the, to create tears for the past. And the third kind of music was Gyantri. And that was music to make you feel happy and make you laugh. So the bards had to be able to produce these three kinds of music. And then there were the consummate storytellers. And uh, I think in modern times, we've lost the art of storytelling and we've lost the kind of the importance and the point of storytelling. We think that basically storytelling is about information, is about um, uh, entertainment and maybe a little bit of information. And while it was that, for the bards, it was a lot, lot more than that. It wasn't about entertainment so much and it wasn't about information so much. It was about transformation. So much more importantly than information, they weren't just dealing in data. They were dealing in uh, trans-dimensional uh, journeys. And so a really great storyteller, like the bard, was able to create the following kinds of situations. Firstly, they would allow uh, the listener to go trans-temporal, to be no longer locked into the now, but to be able to move between times, between past and future, and to step out of time completely, in fact. They allowed the listeners, and as an art listening, we sometimes forget that, that it's a two-way art, it's the art of telling the story, and it's the art of listening to the story. And this was Jesus' great frustration when he said, you know, hearing you hear, but you don't understand, seeing you see, but you don't comprehend. Because you have to listen not just with your ears, you have to be listening with your soul in order to understand the bards or Jesus' parables. So uh, you have to go trans-temporal and trans-spatial. You're no longer identified with the here or the now. So you've gone trans-temporal and trans-spatial. You've gone trans-rational. And by that, I don't mean that you've become irrational. It means you've gone beyond mere reason. You have become post-rational. And so you're engaging with the storyline, not just with your intellect. You're not just unpacking the concepts you know, cognitively. You're unpacking it at a soul level, an intuitive level, and a heart level. The great storyteller and the great story listener is able to go transpersonal. So you're no longer identified just with the ego, you know, with the skin encapsulated ego or the notion of a separate self. And finally, you're, it allows you to go transdimensional. You're surfing not just the physical dimensions of moving from Ireland to Africa, you know, or from the 21st century to the 13th century. You're going out of dimensions completely and you're engaging with energies and entities that have no physical extension whatsoever. And so to kind of sum that up, the bard was the person who made, who made traveler, time travelers and mystics of the listeners. 
So that's basically, that was, that was the function of the bird. Secondly came the ovates, and where the bards were the keepers of the past, the ovates were the keepers of the future. So they were the ones, for instance, who created the ceremonies where people, you know, walked through rites of passage. And so it was the induction of people into various stages of their incarnational purpose and their relationship to the tribe and to the planet. So they were the great ritual, uh, uh, people who created the ritual that allowed us, you know, to move into the future and to go through the various stages of the life journey. So if you were to put the kind of modern terms on it, you could say that there were seers or psychics or shamans, or visionaries or prophets in some senses, as long as we understand what the word prophet means. Uh, because the purpose of the prophet is not to foretell the future, it's to forestall the future. It's to stop us making stupid mistakes. The function of the prophet is not to predict the future, but rather to prevent the future. Because the prophet and the uh, Ovid is the person who can see so clearly who we are and what we're doing that they know where we're headed if we don't get our act together. So it's a group that's vitally needed on our planet right now to be able to prevent us from going where we seem to be headed, you know, and to forestall us from creating what we seem to be creating. And so that was the great uh, function of the Ovids, to be able to see the present so clearly that they could help us forestall the, the future that we don't want to happen. So there would be the Ovids. The Druids then, in some senses, are the keepers of the now. And they're the intellectual giants of the Celtic world. When I give you a list of the functions they performed, it's just amazing, you know, how that like, one person or one kind of... Uh, cadre could have that kind of wisdom, that kind of knowledge, and that kind of responsibility. So there were the scientists of the time, and particularly the science of astronomy, which was a real science. So it wasn't just that they regarded, you know, the heavenly bodies as dead rocks whirling through space, but that the heavenly bodies are intellectual partners in a cosmic dance, you know, of which we are a part. And so their science also is the science of what our place in the cosmos is and how they relate to us and we relate to them. There were the great philosophers, philosophia meaning the lovers of wisdom. So there were the great thinkers about the existential issues and the important kinds of problems. And there were the psychologists. There were the people who could figure out, you know, how the human mind worked and what, how we got into difficulties and how to, you know, be therapists for us when that happened. There were the theologians and there were the priests. And so they dialogued with and told us about the goddesses and the gods. There were the healers who helped us to maintain a balance among all of these moving parts and to be in dialogue with all of these moving parts. And finally, there were the lawyers and there were the judges. So they created and interpreted a system of law which is known in Irish as the Brehan laws. And the Brehan laws are much, much, much older than the English legal code, literally by almost 2000 years. And it was a system of laws in which there was no capital punishment for any crime, including murder. There was, it was called a system called uh, the payment of Eric. Eric in Gaelic, E-I-R-I-C, was a payment, it was a system of fines, that there were various fines exacted for particular kinds of crimes, including murder. And the, the fines were typically paid with cattle. So the finance was, the currency was cattle. And it was interesting that, you know, that was true as well for the peoples among whom I lived in Kenya, that the Kalenjin peoples, and the Maasai whom you know, that the currency was cattle. They didn't deal in money. Uh, cattle was, you know, a person's wealth was estimated by the number of cows. And among the Kalenjin people, you know, the Kalenjin often, they wouldn't put a name to uh, a dog or a cat, but every single cow, you know, would have a name. And the, uh, the herder knew exactly which animal uh, you were talking about, even if they had you know, 200 head of cattle. So that was the Celtic way as well. 
So that, that's the, they're the wisdom keepers. That's the section B. For the Celts then, there were three sacred realms. And this is very, very shamanistic. If you're, if you're off air at all with shamanism, you know that, that the, the shamans of all traditions, whether you're talking about Mongolia, you know, or South America, uh, or the Africa, or the Celtic world, there were three great realms. And so these realms were the heavenly realms, which were populated by the goddesses and the gods. There was the earthly realm populated by human beings and by flora and fauna, which had a, a hugely important place in their thinking. And then there was the underworld, which was populated by our ancestors and by the fairy folk, the Tuha de Danan. And these three realms constantly interacted with each other. They weren't separated. And in fact, the, uh, the Celtic knot, which you'll find in all great illustrated Irish manuscripts, is always a Trinitarian formula. There are always three strands to the Celtic knot, you know, representing these three realms. So in some senses, long, long, long before the Catholic Church came up with the notion of the communion of saints, where they talked about, you know, the church suffering, which was in purgatory, and the church triumphant, which was in heaven, and the church militant, which was on earth, terrible titles for it, the Celts had gotten there much, much, much earlier. So the Celts had a notion of, I would call it, the communion of all sentient beings, representing all these three realms. So everything that existed in the, kind of the phenomenological realms that could be experienced was part of that family. So this truly was, it was a vision worthy of our, of our cosmic spirituality. So there'd be the, the realms in which they lived and with which they interacted. Section D, you want to talk about thin places. In Gaelic, we call it chyloit, a narrow place or a thin place. And it's a place where uh, the veil between the mystical and the mundane, between the sacred and the secular is diaphanous. And you can see through it and move through it if you know how to do so. There are entry points into different dimensions. There are the ways in which you interact with the other realms. And these can be, uh, there can be rocks, there could be lakes, there could be rivers, there could be groves of trees. Because at the time the Celts came to Ireland, Ireland was very, very heavily forested. It will be much, much later in the 1500s when the British began to cut down the forests in Ireland uh, for shipbuilding purposes. But at that stage, Ireland was very, very heavily forested. So specific groves of trees would be thin places. But thin places uh, could also be like uh, your imagination was a thin place. Music was a thin place. Storytelling was a thin place. Poetry was a thin place. And so songs and music are the thin place. So I'm going to read for you the oldest Irish poem extant, which comes from about 600 BCE. And it's called The Song of Avergeen. And Avergeen was the chief bard of the Celts when they arrived in Ireland. And um, when he steps off the boat as they're trying to conquer the land of Ireland, he sings this song. And it's written in ancient Irish. There's a lot of dispute about the actual translation of it. So if you've ever studied English literature, for instance, English literature is divided into three phases. There's modern English literature, there's kind of middle English, you know, maybe around Chaucer's time, and then there's old English. And most of us couldn't read even Middle English at this stage, let alone Old English. So the same thing is true for the language of this poem. It's ancient, ancient uh, Gaelic. And so there have been many, many attempts to kind of translate it. And so there's some agreement and there's some disagreement. So I'm just going to read one translation for you. And I want you to focus on the first two words in every line, because I'm going to make a comment on that. So he's stepping off the boat about to invade this land, and he's bringing his own uh, spirituality and his own cosmology with him. And he says, I am the wind on the sea. I am the stormy wave. I am the sound of the ocean. I am the bull with seven horns. I am the hawk on the cliff face. I am the sun's tear. I am a beautiful flower. I am the boar on the rampage. I am the salmon in the pool. I am the lake on the plain. I am the defiant word. 
I am the spear charging into battle. I am the God who put fire in your head, who made trails through the stone mountains, who knows the age of the moon, who knows where the setting sun rests, who took the cattle from the house of the war crow, who pleases the war crow's cattle. What bull, what God created the mountain skyline, the cutting word, the cold word. And when I think of this, two things come up for me. Parts of it remind me of um, the famous passage from Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything under heaven, you know that one? Except this one is much, much, much ancient than Ecclesiastes, which was written about maybe 200 BC. And the most interesting thing to me is that phrase, I am, I am, I am, that repeats. Mm -hmm. There's a famous story in the book of Exodus in chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses is having an encounter with the God whom he doesn't know. And uh, this God reveals himself as the I am. But he tells Moses, don't come near. Put off your shoes. You're on sacred ground. Don't come near. There's a totally different notion in the Celtic world. In the Celtic world, God is not this distant, hands-off, distant, demanding deity, stay away, I'm sacred. He is the I am of everything that you're going to encounter, from the tears of the sun to the raging boar to the salmon in the pool, that everywhere you look and every encounter you have, in some senses, represents who God is. So that, in some senses, that's what it means to have, uh, to encounter a thin place. That's section D. So section E, nature. And of everything I'd say about uh, Celtic spirituality, I'd say this is uh, the, the most important, the single most important teaching of um, Celtic spirituality, our relationship to nature. So again, I want to compare it with the notion that comes through the mistaken interpretation of uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where having created everything and finally having created uh, a man and a woman and introduced them into the Garden of Eden and given them you know, the, the opportunity of naming all of the creatures that they found there. And I've said this many times to you that when God said to Adam and Eve, you get to name the animals. He wasn't saying to them, okay, I want you to hang, hang an identity tag and everything you see here. So whatever you call the guy with the long neck, I'll call him that. Whatever you call the thing that's inside Michelle creeping on the ground, I'll call it that. So he wasn't that God was saying, okay, you get to call them, you get to hire, give them a kind of an ID tag. He wasn't saying that. God was saying, I've created all of these as companions. Every tree, every rock, every lake, every creepy crawly, every flying thing. I've created all of these as your companions on the journey. Now, naming them for the Hebrews to name something was to be to able to enter into a hugely important close relationship with. It wasn't hang an identity tag on. And so in some senses, it even gave you power over them because when you know somebody's name, you know their essence. And when you know somebody's essence, you know, you could use that badly by having power over them. So I'm convinced, for instance, that every soul who volunteers for incarnation, that the last, the last thing of the soul as it wings its way into incarnation is your sacred, sacred name. We all come in with a secret, sacred name, which defines who we are and what our mission is. The name we're given by our parents or the name we're given at baptism or the name that appears in your driving license has nothing got to do with your essence. There's a sacred name you've been given. There's a secret name that you've been given. And God was asking Adam and Eve, you know, to recognize that secret, sacred name of everything that existed in the garden with him. And the phrase that's used in Hebrew is, he gave them Radha over nature. And Radha really means responsibility for, the responsibility of entering into a sacred relationship with everything that is. Unfortunately, we have misinterpreted this throughout human history, and we have given it two other meanings, Radha. We've interpreted it as meaning a resource, or uh, giving us the right to exploit. And that's how we've treated nature. The Celts did not make that mistake. 
for the Celts, nature was always sacred. And so uh, the goddesses whom you encounter in uh, Celtic lore, these goddesses are archetypes of nature. And the gods whom you encounter in Celtic lore are the archetypes of culture. And so culture and nature are passionate lovers. They're not bitter rivals, such as you find in most of the developed Western world. Culture and nature represented by uh, the gods and the goddesses as archetypally, you know, are partners in a sacred uh, uh, loving dance. And the mission then of the Ovet, uh, the keeper of the future, the prophet, was to continually call culture back into alignment with nature. So when I say that the, the, the function of the prophet is not to predict the future, it's to prevent the future. It is to call the people back into their covenant relationship with nature, to call culture back into the covenant with nature. And that's the real meaning of the notion of covenant in the great mystical Hebrew tradition. That when we read about God making a covenant, you know, initially with Noah, and then with Abraham, and then with Moses, you know, and then with Jesus, What's, what they're talking about here is that this was uh, God again and again and again calling uh, people back into a covenant relationship with nature and if so with the God who manifests, you know, Im immanently as nature. So all of the great mystical traditions, uh, Judaism, Buddhism, Sufism, and, and obviously the Celtic tradition knew that. So that was the purpose and the, that was the function of the, of the prophet, to call culture uh, when it strayed back into its, its dance with nature. In fact, there was a very uh, important uh, ceremony that took place on a regular basis. Whenever the high king of Ireland died and was to be succeeded, it wasn't a family succession. It wasn't that I'm high king of Ireland and now I die and my son inherits from me. It wasn't that. It would be that there'd be several candidates, you know, uh, submit themselves for the task. And they would be presented with, there was a, a sacred Irish rock. In, in Irish, we call it the Leah Foil, which is roughly translated as the Stone of Destiny. And what would happen was, these seven candidates would be brought up in front of this rock, this sacred stone. And uh, they would have to touch it one by one. And the rock would sing when the person whom it had chosen, you know, had touched it. So of the seven or eight candidates, you know, mostly the rock would be mute to the touch. But when the designated heir touched it, the song, the, the, the leofoil, the rock, the sacred rock would sing. And then the, there would be a, a sacred ceremony in which this candidate was now married officially to the goddess of the planet, the goddess of nature an actual ceremony. And if the high king proved to be a faithful steward of the dance and a protector of nature, then the land would, would, would flourish and prosper. There would be great harvests. If the king proved to be unfaithful and didn't keep the covenant, there would be famine and there would be war in the land. And so this then was the vibrant, mystical, nature-aligned spirituality that Christianity would subsequently encounter when it arrived in Ireland. So that's basically what I want to say about, about section one. Section two then, uh, what was it like when they met? So I'm sure in your study of world history, you realize that typically when two great cultures encounter each other, often it's in bloody battles. And often, you know, it is that the superior force militarily, you know, conquers uh, the others. And very, very often, the conquest doesn't just end with military occupation. Very often, it, 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 it ends with the suppression of the existing culture and even sometimes of the existing language. And since language, you know, uh, and storytelling is the archive of the wisdom of a culture, when you kill their language, you kill their stories. And when you kill their stories, you kill their spirituality. So very, very often, certainly it was the case when uh, Spain and Italy and uh, Europe encountered the, the, new, the new world. That was the, the result. Not only were 
90% of the local population wiped out because they didn't have immunity to smallpox and other things, but they were culturally, you know, destroyed. Books, great Mayan books and Aztec wisdom destroyed uh, by Europeans. And so that tends to be what happens when uh, great uh, cultures encounter each other. Gratefully, this did not happen when Christianity encountered uh, the Celtic uh, tradition. There was an extraordinarily, you know, mutually uh, beneficial cross-fertilization that happened. And so it proved to be a fairly seamless, you know, encounter between Christianity coming from Europe and the Celtic wisdom. And the things I believe that allowed that to happen was that the two storylines, the storyline of the Celts and the storyline of Christianity had enough in common that they, they were kind of amenable to each other, but they had enough differences to be attractive to each other. And I've seen that again and again and again in, uh, as a, a psychologist when I do couples counseling that the, uh, the really great marriages are where there's enough in common that people can cohabit, you know, without any kind of violence. And at the same time, there's enough difference that they can, they can learn from each other and stretch each other. And so these two great storylines, the Celtic storyline and the Christian story tale, had enough in common where they could kind of recognize each other and enough difference in which they could, you know, stretch and attract each other. So it was storytelling, in my opinion, that uh, was that great interface between the two. And as I keep saying, I believe that stories are the archived wisdom of a culture. So the gospel is just a series of stories. You know, the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures are a series of stories. The Talmud in, in Hebrew is a series of stories. The Mishnah is stories and interpretations of stories. That's the great wisdom of any tribe, the stories they tell, you know, which are uh, misunderstood so often, you know, by modern people who think that the stories are stupid because they're obviously, obviously not scientific or sometimes not even factual, but that is not the importance of storytelling. The importance of storytelling is that it gives you a kind of in parabolic form, it engages your soul and your heart and in your, in your intuition so that you stretch beyond fact into truth. And I've defined this many, many times for you that there's a huge difference between fact and truth. Something can be factual, but not true. And something can be true, but not factual. Facts have to do just with the physical world and data we glean from it. It comes from our senses and is processed by our intellect. Wisdom comes from the soul and it's processed by the heart. And uh, that's, tr uh, that's true. That's truth. For me, something is true only if it transforms me and aligns me with God. And something is ultimate truth if it transforms me radically and aligns me permanently with God. And so that's the importance of storytelling. Storytelling, when you know how to go trans-dimensional and trans-temporal and trans-spatial and transpersonal, you know, it allows you to access uh, the truth of transformation, self-transformation and transformation of the world. And so uh, these are two groups now telling stories to each other as the Hebrews told them, you know, as the Sufis tell them, you know, as uh, the Celts told it. So it was interesting to me that the bards, you know, the great storytellers of ancient Ireland, they had a written language. It's called Om, spelt in Gaelic O-G-H-A-M, but pronounced as Om. G-H in Gaelic is silent. So Om was a written system. And out on my deck out here, there's a standing stone that my brother created for me, Seamus. He was visiting me some years ago. Uh, he put this, it's a, a piece of wood actually that he painted to look like a rock standing on my deck. And uh, OM is a series of straight lines. They can be either horizontal or they can be diagonal. And they, they're always on the corner of the rock. They can come up to the corner or they can go across the corner. So there are 20 letters in the alphabet of OM. So I come home, I, at that stage, I was going out to Palo Alto three days a week, you know, at, uh, for counseling and for a Eucharist with COJ. And I come back up on a Sunday night. I come back up on Sunday night. I see this thing standing in my deck. And I look at it and I re rec recognize it's OM. And I can see that I can count off, there's 11 letters to it. I'm thinking, what the hell did he just write in that? 
<laughs> and then I start looking at it, I start recognizing, uh, see for instance that the second letter and the 11th letter are the same. Yeah, that's interesting. And then I see that the third letter and the, like the seventh letter are the same letter, and then I get it. He's written my name, Sean no later. And so there are two E's in it and there are two O's in it. And so by recognizing him, I could decipher what he had written. Now I said that was Om. And so Om was that language existed, the parts of that language. But they never wrote their stories. And the reason for it was that stories are a living, evolving wisdom. They're not meant to be trapped in a final form. And so the oral tradition become hugely important. They, they, they chose not to write it down for the simple reason that subsequent, you know, generations of storytellers would remember in detail what they'd heard, but then they would add their own particular piece to it. And again, within the Jewish tradition, you've got two great strands of Jewish um, wisdom and uh, um, the written tradition and the oral tradition. And so they both become hugely, hugely important, you know, in the evolution of, uh, of Jewish spirituality. So we see the very same thing with Jesus' own parables. He never wrote a single thing, except on one occasion in John chapter 8, when they bring before him a woman accused of adultery, and he, he says, let, let the guy among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he bent down, he started writing on the ground with his finger in the sand. That's the only record of Jesus having written anything. So he never wrote down any of his stories. Because again, the stories are meant to be unpacked and to grow with the listener. And as you enter different phases of your own life, you're going to unpack every story you've ever heard, whether it's, you know, the, the Grimm's Brothers, fairy tales from Europe, or the parables of Jesus, you know, or the stories your grandmother told you. They're meant to be unpacked differently at various stages of your lives, as are the parables of Jesus, and as are the great stories of the scriptural traditions of the world. Now, at some stage in Irish history, you know, in the med medieval times, uh, the actually began to record these stories, put them in written, in written form. And some of them are beautifully illustrated, like for instance, uh, the Book of Kells. So they illustrated these manuscripts. They didn't just write down the storyline. There's, there's as much uh, of a message in the illustrations as there is in the, in the, kind of the storyline itself. Of course, in the process, they sanitized some of the stories and Christianized them. And again, that's true of any tradition. Whenever you meet a good story, you know, you're going to give it uh, legs and add to it. You know, you're going to put your own spin on it. You know, so as you pass it on, you're in, in the lineage, but you're in some senses interpreting it and adding to it as you uh, retell the story yourself. And so the fact that the Celtic monks in the Middle Ages, that they recorded it, put it in writing in a kind of a final form and sanitized it in the process and even Christianized some of the great heroes of the past in the process, that too is part of the organic nature of storytelling. And you find that in your own family. You know, whatever stories were passed down to you from your great grandparents or whatever, and whatever stories you choose to tell to your children, it'll be very interesting in 30 years time, you know, how 2020 will be told. What will be the story of 2020 in the year 2050? Who will be saying what about this time we're going through? And who will be the heroes and the heroines of those stories? So in the Celtic tradition of storytelling, there are these, there again, there's, there's two strands of storytelling. And the two strands are the oral and the written form. And again, they're braided tradition in the storytelling tradition. And so if I just go through it kind of chronologically, you, when we're kind of just going from one foot to the other, the bards, completely read, it depended on the oral tradition. They refused to write. The medieval monks depended on the written form. From the 14th to the 17th century, the great, what we call in Gaelic, the Shanachi. The Shanachi is the storyteller. So in that, it, it gets gone back to the oral tradition again. These were particularly the grandfathers who sat by the turf fires in the evenings and to whom the village would gather to listen to the great sagas of pre-Christianity and the great stories of Irish history and the great, you know, funny stories of the village in which they grew up. So the Shanachi would go back to the oral tradition. 
Then in the 1800s, you had a great movement to archive all of these stories because the fear was they'd get lost. So now you're back again to the written version and some extraordinary uh, folklorists, you know, who uh, gathered these stories and wrote them down. And then the modern version, and by modern I'm talking about times in which I grew up, 1940s, 1950s, and my grandfather was the designated storyteller of our village. And again, it's back to the oral tradition. So it's gone from oral to written to oral to written. And then in my seminary days, I had the uh, extraordinary privilege of meeting a man called Seamus of the Lerger. And Seamus of the Lerger had founded the Irish Folklore Commission way back in 1926. And I got the opportunity to meet him uh, sometime in the late 60s. He came to visit uh, the seminary and I had a correspondence with him subsequently. And Seamus had, uh, in the 1920s, was afraid that uh, the stories would be lost forever. And so we hit upon a brilliant scheme. He trained the Irish uh, primary school teachers how to train the children to go into their own homes and interrogate their own grandparents and bring back the stories and the teachers then recorded these stories, hand wrote these stories. And in the 1930s, when the old phonograph was invented, Seamus sent uh, folklorists all over the country recording the voices of these great shanachis, these great storytellers. So you had the actual flavor and the accents you know, at various parts of Ireland. And they were huge for such a small country. There are hugely, there are huge differences in accents and dialects of Gaelic from, let's say, uh, from Donegal, which is in the Northwest, uh, to Galway, which is the West, to Cork and Kerry, which is the Southwest. It's like there are almost three different versions of Gaelic. And so I can understand, obviously, uh, the Gaelic of Cork and Kerry. Uh, I was brought up with it. I can understand a little bit the Gaelic of uh, Galway because my mother was from that area, but I find it really difficult to understand the Gaelic of North, Northwest of Ireland from Donegal. And uh, I can understand a little bit of the Gaelic of Scotland, but I find it impossible to understand the Gaelic of, um, of Wales. So there were, th there were six great uh, uh, Celtic areas you know, that survived the ancient world. Uh, Northwest France, Brittany, which had uh, uh, a language called Brehan. You had the uh, southwest of England, Cornwall, had a Celtic language. You had the Isle of Man in between Ireland and England, which was Gaelic speaking. You had Wales on the most westerly part of the United Kingdom, which was Gaelic speaking. You had Scotland at the very north of the UK, which was Gaelic speaking. And you had Ireland. And um, the last Gaelic speaker of the Isle of Man died sometime in the 1970s. And the last Gaelic speaker in Cornwall died, I believe, in the 1800s. But there's still a very thriving group in uh, Wales. It has the biggest population of native Celtic speakers, about 300,000 people right now, uh, followed by Ireland, I think, then Scotland, and a group in, in uh, northwestern France in Brittany. And so uh, these were encoded. He wanted, uh, Seamus O'Dellierga wanted to hear the, uh, the accents as well as the storylines. And he sent these kids out, you know, and the people with the phonographs out. And uh, by in within about 20 years, uh, the Irish Folklore Commission had collected 1.5 million manuscript pages of Irish stories. So that, I believe, was um, that was how they met, and that was the way in which they interfaced. And it was the, uh, the storytelling that proved to be the kind of the, uh, uh, the great docking mechanism. So I just uh, ask you, think in your own life, the two questions I have for you before you ask me questions. The first one is, what were the stories you told when you wanted to kind of bond with somebody, either as an individual basis or you know, in a group format? What stories did you tell about yourself? are about you know, things which are important to you. What did you want people to know about you in order for you to form a meaningful relationship with them as individuals or as uh, groups? And maybe much more importantly today, what stories are you going to tell 
about 2020? And who will the heroes and the heroines of those stories be? Namaste. Thank you. I mean, it's hugely important. I, uh, for anybody who was at church yesterday, I devoted a section of the homily yesterday to talking about God, you know, as nature, uh, Mother Mother Gaia, and the hugely important uh, place uh, that she she plays in our in our journey. And so, you know, just a very quickly reprise that section of yesterday, based on a vision I had many many years ago of Gaia, you know, volunteering to animate planet Earth and signing up. Uh, to uh, create a species which would ident which would be able to kind of identify its own in the inner divinity and ipso facto the divinity of all else that is, and uh, I talked about five stages of motherhood: conceiving, carrying, birthing, nurturing, and releasing. And I stepped through those five stages of the ways in which nature had done, done that to us, for us, and uh, down to even allowing us to make the kinds of mistakes that we're making in order to invite us to move from free will to freedom. Free will being the ability to do as I please and freedom being the ability to do as pleases God. And so the only truly free person is the person who's choosing to do the good. And uh, I would say that easily our greatest teacher, certainly for me personally, the greatest teacher I have in my own spirituality, two things, Eucharist and nature. The distinction I make between truth and fact is the following. Facts have to do with the physical world in which we find ourselves. And so there are data points we garnish through our sensorium and we process through our intellect. Wisdom, which leads to truth, is uh, uh, data that's generated by the, um, by the soul and is processed by the heart. Now, the distinction between fact and truth, then, as I said, that something can be factual but not true. Something be true but not factual. So, uh, for instance, I presume the Dow Jones is at a particular number today. I have no idea what that number is. But I'm sure if you were in the financial business and went to the Financial Times, you could figure out exactly what the Dow Jones is today. That's a fact. Is that truth? No, it's not truth. Because it doesn't transform you whatsoever. If you hear something that transforms you, that's true, whether or not it's factual. And I'll give you an example I've, I've given a few times in the past. If you were listening to Jesus in a famous debate he had, somebody asked him, you know, what are the two great commandments of Torah? And there's 613 precepts in Torah. And Jesus said, I, I could boil it down to you from 613 down to, to one. It's to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your whole strength. And he said, and as a bonus, I'm going to tell you what the second one is, even though you didn't ask. The second one is, you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then the guy went and said, okay, but who is my neighbor? And typical, you know, Semitic teacher, instead of answering the question like philosophically or theologically, he answered with a story. He said, there was a certain man going down from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was mugged. And they took everything off and left him naked at the side of the road, dying. And sometime later, one of the priests from the temple was going down, and he saw a fellow Jew lying, almost dying on the side of the road, and he, he, by, he passed by because it is verboten for a Jewish priest to touch a dead body. He would be unclean and couldn't celebrate. He couldn't go to the temple, so he passed by. Sometime later, um, one of the Levites, who were the, uh, like the sacristans or the temple police, passed, saw the guy, and ignored him and kept going because he too was under the same uh, pure, purity laws. If he touched this guy and the guy was actually dead, he was unclean and he couldn't enter the temple. So he passed by. A few hours later, a Samaritan passed by and the, the Jews and the Hebrew and the Jews and the Samaritans at the time were at loggerheads with each other since the, uh, the fall of the first temple and the, the um, sequestering of the last two tribes of Judah and Benjamin uh, to the land of Babylon. So there's this rivalry between the Samaritans who remained in the country and the Jews who were exiled. And so there's no love lost between them. So Jesus is saying, a Samaritan went down the same road and he saw this Jewish man lying at the side of the road and he had pity on him. And he went over and he poured wine into the wounds to kind of cauterize or purify them. And he put this man up on his own donkey 
and he ran all the way down to Jericho and he checked into a little hotel and he tended to him and then he said to the innkeeper, I need to go away in business for a few days, so can you look after this guy? When I come back, I'll pick up the tab. And then Jesus said, which of these people was, was a neighbor to the man who was mugged? And of course the answer was, you know, the Samaritan. So I'm totally convinced, if you were a reporter from the Jerusalem Post, and you heard Jesus telling that story, and you said, you know what? There's something really fishy about this story. I'm going to check out that story. So you go to the temple and you knock at the door, and the high priest comes out, and you tell him what the score is, and you say, can you make a quick check and find out, did any of you, any of the priests from here, go down to Jericho in the last week? And he goes in and he checks, nobody's been in Jericho for a month. So he goes over to the Levites and he knocks at the door, and one of the Levites comes out and he tells him the story. He says, could you just check for me whether anybody from here went down to Jericho, you know, in the last month? <coughs> so then the Jerusalem Post guy goes down to Jericho, and there's only five or six inns in Jericho. He goes around from inn to inn to inn, and he interrogates the innkeepers and says, by any chance did a Samaritan man come down here with a, a Jewish, an injured Jewish man and tend for him and pick up the tab? I think he was there. Are you joking me? Never happened. So you go back to Jesus and said, that was a crock. That story you told. That was totally made up. And maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't factual. But was it true? Absolutely. Anybody who heard that story and understood the story were transformed. They had a whole new meaning of what a neighbor meant. And so that's what I mean by the difference between fact and truth. When you hear something that transforms you, that makes you a loving, compassionate, forgiving being, filled with hope for the future, in spite of the dark times in which we live, yeah, that's truth. When you hear a story which is crippling you, even if it's factual, it's not true. And so to get the second part of your question, where does that leave us in our lockdown or, or right now? There are many, many aspects to this lockdown. There are many, many stories about, you know, how it got started. And many, many theories. And trying to figure out fact from fiction there is huge. There are many, many groups who are trying to harvest this for their own ends. And again, there's fact and truth in those stories. Now, the important thing becomes then, you know, and I've stressed this since the lockdown. I dealt with you know, what it means as an individual to be locked down, as a family to be locked down, as a nation to be locked down, and as a global community to be locked down. What is the invitation of this? Because that's what's going to transform. It's important for us to think through about the other stuff, you know, to try and figure out what the origin actually is. To find out, you know, was there any deviousness, deviousness associated with this thing? Was it made in a lab? Was it released? intentionally or accidentally, they're all things we have to figure out as facts, and they're important that they be found out. Also, is there any other agenda going on here? Is there any other reason apart from, you know, keeping us healthy, you know, for this lockdown? Is there any other reason for keeping the lockdown in place? Is there any reason for this waiting for a vaccine that's going to cure all of us, you know, instead of uh, uh, health, healthy bodies, which have billions of bacteria and viruses constantly? All those need to be investigated factually, and scientifically, but much more importantly than all of those, for me, it is, what is the transformative invitation of the times in which we live? And so I talked a little bit about this yesterday, actually, when I talked about God as mother. And so uh, all of the mystics tell us of every tradition that uh, anything we say about God is made up. Mm -hmm. God is an ineffable, transcendent reality even to kind of um, give categories to God is made up. But it is true that we can experience that which is beyond ourselves, and we all do. And so I tend to want to kind of uh, divide up the, the discussion of the divine into two categories, what I'm going to call the transcendent aspect of God, the utter ineffable mystery about which we can say nothing, and then the immanent I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, which means guide that mystery as it reveals itself through, you know, the, um, the uh, what would they call it? The phenomenological realms, the realms which can be experienced. And experience is not just confined to the sensorium. We experience stuff uh, intuitively. We experience stuff at a heart level. 
we experience stuff at a soul level. So phenomenology represents all of the different ways in which human beings can uh, experience or encounter a reality. So for me then, all we can say about God that's meaningful is to try to wrestle with the various ways in which we experience the ineffable transcendent mystery. And so I believe that the entire cosmos in which we find ourselves is the unfolding, and I said this yesterday, of a divine thought form. So the divine thought form creates a kind of an energetic blueprint, which is held, you know, when I talk about the five categories of conceiving, carrying, birthing, nurturing, and releasing, that this is true for me as well in my cosmology of the divine that there is a transcendent mystery which somehow, in my fallible thinking and uh, language, somehow conceived a thought, a God thought, uh, which was a, a blueprint or a, a prototype of what could be. That was the, the conceiving part of it. The carrying part was that that divine mystery held that thought form in pre-time. And I mentioned yesterday that, you know, when you ask a scientist, what happened before the Big Bang? And they said to you, that's meaningless because the Big Bang created time. And you say, okay, the Big Bang was an explosion. Where did it happen? And they said, that's a stupid, stupid question because uh, the Big Bang created space. It created space and time. So it's meaningless to ask, you know, where did the Big Bang happen? And when did the Big Bang occur? Because the Big Bang created both time and space. Now, that's a very kind of a, I don't think a very honest way of avoiding the, the question because they have no idea what the answer is. No idea what it is. It's like saying somebody went into remission. Medicine tells you somebody went into remission. They can't explain how the disease has gone. There are reasons why the disease went, but they can't admit it. So they say it's, you know, it's only a fluke. So remission is a simple, a, a fancy medical term for we don't know what the hell happened. And the Big Bang is a scientific term for we don't know what the hell happened. And so somehow in pre-time, before the physical cosmos was born, God held this God thought in pre-time. That's the carrying of it. And then birthed it into time at some stage. And so birthing it into time meant that there was a physical articulation of the God thought, which we see in the night sky and when we look out our windows. And she continued to nurture that by a process of evolution. And so for me, evolution is simply the tracks that the Holy Spirit leaves as she moves us towards self-realization. That's what evolution means for me. It's mm -hmm. God tracks that the Holy Spirit leaves in the evolutionary trajectory. And then she releases us. She allows us, she gives us the final gift that God bestows on a species which has reached not just self-awareness, and self-regulation and self-reflection with the possibility of self-transformation, then and only then does God give the final gift of free will, the ability to make choices, to please ourselves, or to find truth. And so what I see then is that this ineffable mystery, this is the guide that makes sense to me. But in order to engage with this guide, I have to engage with how it's manifested uh, through nature or through science you know, or through writing or stories or parable or music or art or whatever. That's the only way in which I can engage with it. And so often we'll form kind of images. They can be visual images, they can be auditory images, they can be olfactory images, but we seem to need to create images in order to kind of make the ineffable more uh, uh, appreciable or sensible to us. So who do I pray to? And when I pray to God, I pray to two things. I pray to that which cannot be prayed to, and I pray to that which I can visualize in some way, whether it's nature or love or compassion, you know. And so I'm trying to direct my prayer to the energy forms that make the changes in my life or make the changes in, in the world. Mm -hmm. So there are two focuses, two foci mm -hmm. for the prayers that I do. I believe that uh, language actually creates mindset. You know, it is very difficult to have a thought when you're pre-linguistic. So when you imagine a situation in which you're reviewing the day that just gone, 
how do you actually deal with that? How do you process that in your own mind? And what you're doing is you're, doing, you're using an internal language. You know, you're talking to yourself or you're recalling conversations you've had with Derek or somebody else. And so you're actually utilizing language uh, to keep, you know, uh, the memories of an encounter or a day present. And so I've actually thought about doing an entire homily on uh, pre-linguistic languages or post-linguistic languages. But for the moment, language is the normal way in which we create our mindsets. And so the stories that a little child hears creates their, their model of reality. And as they artic articulate their reality and their experiences, they're going to use the images they've heard, you know, and they're going to use the stories they heard to both formulate their thinking, you know, and communicate their thinking to you. Now, every language has a unique perspective. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 7,000 languages on planet Earth. By the end of the 20th century, there were only 5,000 mm -hmm. left. We lost 2,000 languages in the 20th century. Now, every language is a unique perspective on life. And there are ways that a language looks at a phenomenon which are totally unique to us. And so when you use, lose a language, you lose a perspective on life. And the difficulty is you may also lose the archived wisdom. Now, gratefully, if it has been uh, written or the storytellers have been recorded or the stories have been translated into languages which survived, we've saved some of it. It's like your house is burning down and you run in and you save what you can save. But there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't save. It's destroyed. And when a language dies, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can be saved. A lot of the stories can be saved, gratefully. A lot of the memories can be saved. But the language itself is gone, it's dead, and with it, an entire perspective on life, a whole, a whole way of looking at life itself has been lost, and then we're diminished. We're now like uh, operating with just what we've rescued from the home. And so I think it becomes really, really important to try to save the languages that we have, you know, and not just archive the stories and the, uh, the kind of proverbs and the music of them, but to keep them alive as long as we can keep them alive. So you've got a whole bunch of questions wrapped into one there, great. So to address the first piece of it, why did I put nature, you know, thin places before nature? Uh, when I talked about thin places, I, I said already that many of the thin places are natural spots like rocks or lakes or rivers or whatever. Uh, but I also said that there are thin places which are associated, say, with imagination or storytelling. And so the thin places can be, you know, uh, nature itself in many of its forms are thin places. But there are thin places which are not just nature. You like imagination and storytelling. So obviously in creating a lecture, you have to create some kind of a sequence for them. So that's the first, the first part of your question. You know, it's not necessarily they come before each other. It's that, you know, you have to separate them out in order to deliver right. some kind of a, a homily. The second part of your question then is, how much time uh, can you afford to spend in these thin places? You know, how much is too much? And the truth is that, you know, there has to be you know, a balance in everything you do. Your uh, spirit in a spacesuit. So you can emphasize the spirit in the spacesuit, or you can emphasize the spacesuit inhabited by the spirit. So you can put a focus on incarnation and what's associated with it, food, work, relationships. Or you can put a focus on the spirit, which the focus might be on prayer or meditation or whatever. So you have to walk in two legs. Mm -hmm. You have to become a bipedal creature to be spiritual. You have to honor the spirit, the, the core identity of who you are, but not identify with that. But then you have to nurture and protect and feed the vehicle which allowed you to have the experience of being temporarily separated from source. And so it's not one or the other, it's both and. You have to be very, very protective of and nurturing of your physicality, your emotions, your mentality, and you have to be very nurturing of uh, your core identity, which is spirit. So it's a bipedal exercise. Uh, it, it's at the core of your being, and you'll only access it by knowing yourself at a deep, deep, deep level. And that's to kind of build on Carl O'Neill's question. This is where uh, extra dimensional uh, voyaging is very important. You're probably not going to find what your sacred, sacred name is by being overly concerned with just, uh, you know, earthly affairs. You're going to access that reality. 
and don't think that when you find the name, it's going to sound like you know Mary or Bill or uh, you know or Sean. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be a, a sound, a, a musical, maybe even a note, a chord, or whatever. It'll be different for different people, but it will resonate at the core of your being. It'll bring you to tears, literally. You'll know it's you, even if you can't reproduce it. You can't vocalize it. You know, mm-hmm. some, it may not be vocalizable. So the secret name doesn't mean that you now can can ever tell people what it is. In fact, if you find what what it is, you shouldn't tell anybody what it is. So that's what I mean by the secret name. I think part of the issue is that we don't understand what the word responsibility means. If I, if I say I'm responsible for the situation, I think that means it's my fault. I caused it somehow. Responsibility literally means, if you, if you break the word into two pieces, it's responsibility. It is the ability to make responses. That's what responsibility really means. It, not mean, it does not mean it's my job to do it, and it doesn't mean that it's my fault it happened. It means that I have the ability to make a response to the situation. Mm-hmm. And if I'm a totally free person, if I've gone from free will to free will, I can choose any response, any response I want. I have the ability to make any response I want. Not just the response that somebody expects from me or demands of me, but that I think brings me into alignment with my sacred name and my purpose on planet Earth. But for most of us, we're burdened because we're told it's your fault this happened, you know, or it's up to you to make this, you know, better or to change the situation. And that is not responsibility. Native American Indians have this great uh, notion. They say the word no is a complete statement. You don't have to explain it or excuse it or justify it. If there's something you don't want to do, all you need to say is no. And then if people demand why are you saying no, you don't have to tell them. If you're really in alignment with your own soul and you know what your purpose is and you know the contribution you want to make to the world, you know immediately whether or not what's being demanded of you is you know, something you want to respond to by agreeing you know, to their agenda for you or something you're choosing to say, no, that's not my purpose. I'm choosing not to put my energy there. So my ability to respond in this instance is to say, no, thank you. You're raising a hugely important point here. Uh, and in some senses, you know, when, when you meet people, the ideal situation is that, you know, everybody respects everybody else and appreciates the perspectives that each person brings to any discussion on any topic and that we learn and grow from each other. It's not that we have to abandon you know, uh, our previous knowledge, our previous wisdom in order to be in relationship. To join a family doesn't mean to, to kind of destroy my individuality. It means to have my individuality respected and engaged with in the greater uh, community of family. You know, so inviting an allegedly third world country to the table of economic goodies at the sacrifice of the language, you know, it, the same thing happened, I think, personally with medicine that modern medicine has invited people into a pharmaceutical world in which the great wisdom traditions of the wise women of the past and homeopathy and Chinese medicine has been abandoned as pseudoscience and quackery. So if you really want to get, get better, you know, wait for a vaccine. They're going to solve all our problems by injecting us. Where this wisdom, this great health wisdom of the past has been abandoned. That's been the price of admission into the pharmaceutical world. And the price of admission into the economic table is the destruction of the languages and the cultures and the wisdom that they had with them. And that's far too high a price to pay for me. So it has to be obviously uh, uh, some of both. There has to be a level playing field that the economic resources had to be distributed equally and the opportunities distributed, not at the cost of the loss of a tradition or a language. That, you know, the, the, the good of modern medicine, whether it's maybe its surgical abilities or its technology, uh, not at the cost of throwing homeopathy and wise women's medicine out the door. It has to be both and. Perfect. Any dialogue which is not prepared to see the other as an equal partner to be cherished, honored, and protected, you know, in, in the ensuing agreement, that for me is not something I want to I touch. To say, no, I'm not interested in that bargain. I agree with you, but you have to differentiate between 
the Christianity that emerged from the meeting with Celtic wisdom in the 4th and 5th and 6th and 7th and 8th and 9th, 9th century and differentiate that from what happened to the Catholic Church you know, in the Dark Ages, in medieval times, and in uh, Vatican I thinking. They're totally different animals, completely different animals. So we have to realize you know, that the, Christian, the Roman Catholicism that you grew up with was a far cry from the Celtic uh, Catholicism that I'm going to talk about in the second lecture. And of course, when any two traditions meet, they're not going to dovetail uh, seamlessly. They're going to be pieces that they'll learn from each other. And so uh, the Christianity learned respect from nature, for nature from the Celts, and the Celts learned from uh, Christianity. So it wasn't just that, you know, there was no issues between them, but that there was no issue which was a deal breaker at that stage. Subsequently, you know, Christianity went off on its own tangent, and I'll talk about that actually in this afternoon, what happened in medieval Europe uh, with the, um, the Dark Ages and particularly with the um, Protestant break from Roman Catholicism. So I'll go into that in much more detail. It's a very important issue.